surprised we're not Zellweger. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Mrs. Fryer? Here. Mr. Posner? Here. Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Sanders? Here. Mr. Scalette? Here. Mr. Trader? Mr. Sears? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. Mr. Toman? Here. Thank you. Uh, reminded to please silence your cell phone during the meeting, and this will be the first opportunity for public comment. All comments and questions will be addressed to the president. Board and staff members will not normally respond to comments or questions during the meeting unless recognized by the president for this purpose. Comments will be limited at the discretion of the presidents to five minutes or less. Do we have any takers? Okay, thank you. Uh, you have the minutes of the regular monthly meeting of January 27th. Do we have any corrections? Then I think they can be approved as submitted. Uh, you have an item that's been linked on here. It's a resolution for charter funding reform. And it will be discussed and voted on at the next meeting. And here it comes. So I will not, I will not read it. The purpose of it is to bring an attention to the current state of the charter schools in Pennsylvania and resolve that we call on the General Assembly to do something about it. So please take some time over the next week, read through it, and we will discuss during the voting meeting. And with that, I will ask for Dr. Williams to take over. Thank you. Uh, we have several presentations tonight, uh, the first of which is a uh, State of the District report. And we also tonight have uh, uh, Crabtree Rohrbaugh, architects, to share with us a vision of, of school reform, uh, not school reform, school construction. This presentation was to be delivered last month. Uh, illness kept kept that away. So uh, in the interest of time, I tried to refine it a little bit and make it a little bit more brief. So now it only has 20-some slides. <laughs> that is, believe it or not, an improvement. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to be run through quickly, but still cover everything that's in there. Um, the pictures on the front page there are various student uh, pictures from various activities and various things. Uh, the district goals this year for 1920 are up there on the screen, and I'll get into those, each of those four a little more quickly, a little more in depth as we move on. The first goal is to develop uh, career exploration opportunities both inside and outside the classroom while maintaining strong academics. Uh, so there's some things we've always done and we continue to do, and there's some new things that we're embarking on. Thing, something that we've always done is, is BizTown, uh, a very uh, highly regarded program for uh, our students to participate in activities related to running a city community. Uh, the mayor there is being inaugurated uh, by Carol Hill Evans, Representative Carol Hill Evans, as part of that process. Uh, the item on the right is a depiction of a co it's a graphic representation of a cooperation that we're doing with uh, York Tech to try to give kids an opportunity to uh, learn more about other occupations and maybe go into an occupation that maybe they didn't think about in eighth grade, because when they're in eighth grade, they have to make a decision as to whether or not they're going to go to York Tech. Uh, for some students, that might be a little too early. Uh, so York Tech has realized that as an issue as well, and Dr. Thomas and I have been working on, on figuring out a way to make it work so that seniors and juniors and seniors in high school can have an opportunity to learn a trade at York Tech and still be our student. That's the key in that process. So that's where we are with, this, with goal one. Goal two, using student achievement data. Uh, to refine curriculum and, and instruction. Um, Dr. Krauser managed somehow, in a way that I can't imagine, he managed to land um, Heidi Hayes Jacobs, who is a very well-known and internationally known educator, uh, to help us uh, refine our curriculum and get that process down and, and learn how better ways to look for weaknesses in our curriculum and address those weaknesses. Uh, Heidi Hayes Jacobs is based in, uh, I think, Connecticut, is that right? Correct. And so she was interested to work with us because Krauser sweet talked her a little bit mm -hmm. and she's able to take Amtrak to get here. So those were both selling points for her to come here and work with us. So we were very fortunate to have her 
uh, working with us in person and uh, via video link and via electronic, other electronic means. Is that underway or is that scheduled? That already started. That's from this summer. That was August uh, and it's ongoing. Uh, the next time, next time we meet face to face with her is? Uh, well, we're trying to, she's out of the country right now. On-site guaranteed is in June. We'll bring the team back at the end of the, end of the year, but we're trying to navigate a springtime for her. She's been, you know, it's the yeah. season that's been consuming her. Uh, she, she's in high demand all over the world, <coughs> not just the United States. So, and go, so along those lines for goal two, we're also, uh, this is a good opportunity to share student achievement data with you related to keystones and PSSAs. So there's not a lot of curriculum refinement we're going to have to do with keystones. As you can see, we perform very well. Um, we're in the top five, six, or seven percent in the state uh, for keystone results. Uh, and you can see our ranking and you can see how close we are to the highest performing school district in Pennsylvania. So we're doing quite well with keystones. <clears throat> Now, the same keystones for the historically underperforming students. Historically underperforming are uh, in individualized education program students, uh, English language learning students, and economically disadvantaged students. And while we have 70%, 75%, 72% proficient in advance in those of the historically underperforming students, which does not seem like a, a high enough number, and it's not, but it still puts us in the top five, seven, and 7% 7 in the state, uh, which is something to be very proud of. P isn't that one of those, I'm sorry, isn't that one of those that they always want to see is closing the gap on that yes. over the years? Well, that, that used to be a big component of um, the school performance profile. Mm -hmm. uh, now they're focused more on growth. Uh, that but became very difficult for Suburban because, thank goodness, when we started way back when, we were pretty close to anyway, and there wasn't a whole lot that we could do. You know, that was the downside of being successful with that uh, with that subgroup in the beginning, because you're right. It, if you're already successful in that subgroup, it's harder to close that gap. Um, but uh, teachers are doing quite well with it. PSSAs, grades three to eight. Uh, you can see our percentages in the top row, and you can see where we fit in top percent in the state. Uh, you can see that while those numbers in the top row aren't that great, if you look at the bottom row, in most cases, that's not so bad, relatively speaking, putting it in context. Sixth grade, you can see, is an area of uh, somewhere we're going to have to focus. So that's language arts for PSSA. PSSA science, uh, numbers are... Let me, let, me, let me pick on you a little. Sure. As, as you look at sixth grade, is that an indication of a weakness in fourth and fifth, or is... You know, why, why would you speculate that that's such an outlier? I don't think it's a weakness in fourth and fifth, and I'll show you what I'm talking about in a couple slides. Okay. Right. I'll leave you alone. And, and, and it'll be with math, not, okay. not ELA. Okay. Uh, PSSA science, you can see our uh, performance in the top row and where we fall percentage-wise across the state. Eighth grade, not a strength. Uh, fourth grade, not terrible, but not where we want to be either. Math, our performance in the top row, bottom row is where we fall percentage-wise in the state. Again, sixth grade is an area that we're going to have to pay more attention to than some other areas. So Just a question of clarification, say the sixth grade, are they taking the exam <laughs> Um, in the spring of sixth grade, correct. So these, so this is reporting the results of having been in sixth grade. Yeah, these are seventh graders now. Seventh graders now. So this would be they, they for each of these levels, they've been in that grade for two thirds of the year when they take this exam. Is yes. that about right? That's about right. Yeah, okay. two thirds, three quarter, right. depending. It's usually in April ish. Do last year's fifth grade numbers look like this? Like, in other words, do you just shift the whole column back? Is this a cohort issue or a year issue? No, it's a year issue. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Now, here, let's talk a little bit about sixth grade math, okay? One area that we are not as successful on as other areas is in the expressions and equations uh, standard in sixth grade math. 
okay? And particularly anchor BE.2, which is create, solve, and interpret one variable equations or inequalities in real world and mathematical problems. Now, I highlight real world for a reason. So in, <clears throat> you can see in the blue text up there, there are nine, in this last iteration of the PSSA, there were nine questions in support of this anchor, okay? We, our students, successfully answered about a third of them correctly. Not a very good number, okay? So what does a question look like in the expressions and equations anchor? Well, there's a question from a release test item. Take a second and look at that. And see if you can either on paper or in your head or not at all, figure out what you're supposed to do here. Mr. Tillman's a numbers guy. I think he's got it already. We'll see if he's got the right answer, which I'm sure he does. Okay, now. <laughs> that's what you're supposed to be doing. That's what a student is supposed to be doing. Now, when we were in school, <laughs> when we were in school, we didn't have a, prob a problem written out like that. We were just given 4x minus 2 equals 10 and solve for x. And that's what we were told to do. Okay? So just because a student doesn't get this question right doesn't mean they don't know how to solve for x. See what I'm saying? So we have to look at this kind of a problem and see if our... <laughs> What's the matter, Mr. Robinson? I'd, I'd rather have the uh, locomotive going down the track. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are they going to meet? When yeah. do they collide? That's, that's a real yeah. question. That's, yeah, right. right. Two, two, two coming together. Yeah. Yeah, when do they come together? How long before they meet? Oh. I had a soccer coach who was a phys ed teacher who had um, said he didn't go into teaching math because when he got a word problem about two trains traveling in, in opposite directions toward each other, one going 90 miles an hour, one going 30 miles an hour, How long before they meet? what How is long the engineer's name? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no. And so he, he figured he can't do it. But so the point is here, though, this isn't simply, the math exam isn't simply solving for X. It requires something more deep than that. You have to have students be able to think through the way the question is written to figure out what the equation is supposed to be. And that's the real world, Tim. Uh, that's, that's right. That's why I highlighted real world. That's not even that. What do you mean? That's vocabulary. It's both. Yeah. Vocabulary because is real world too, that, Mike. If they're getting, well, yeah. But if they're getting that wrong, that's not understanding probably product of x and 4. I think it's more. Well, that's why you have those understanding that expression is the whole thing. The math test you is also a reading expression test. Expression equals yeah. ten. You, you're good to go. Yeah. Then you can figure out what yeah. the expression. Never had reading until you got to college yeah. course, then you got all the yeah. Mm -hmm. But these are these are the things that that lead to the discussion about the foundational skills that are outside mathematics. If the reading skills are weak and the vocabulary skills are weak, you aren't going to. You don't stand a chance with this, but you could still, given the blue stuff, do very well. Yeah. If, if you can do the blue the stuff, equation, that doesn't mean you can do the other stuff. Solve it. But if you need to read to get it, which is really, I think, what we're saying here. And this is kind of uh, embodies what the, the Pennsylvania core is all about. Mm -hmm. It's about requiring people to think through a process and being able to come up with an answer not just simply solving for x. So that's what we have to get better at with our students on this anchor to help them be more successful in PSSAs. Okay, also I wanted to throw in there some other stuff about ACTs and SATs. Um, uh, before you move on, I, I wanted yeah. to go back to the, uh, the science results because there seemed to be a, um, in terms of the one that was, that was most challenged. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the math, it was that eighth grade science. Well, our, our sixth grade math is, is lower than 48%. Uh, so oh, the eighth grade science is almost as, as, but they're both not good. Gotcha, gotcha, yes. Um, any comments on the science? I think it's a curriculum alignment issue. And we're going to have to dive into that. And it, it's not about, it's not that we're teaching poorly. 
it's just we may not be addressing the right standards in science class for those kids to be successful on the exam. And there's a certain level I look at these type of test results, and I see those as a minimum bar of excellence, Correct. but not the full story of excellence. So, you know, what's the other kind of data we can gather evidence about how we are providing excellent education, of which this is an indicator in one way or the other, but it's, it's almost like I consider this a, a, not the highest bar that we need to achieve. Agreed. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, and agreed. those standards are changing this spring. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think what bothers me is the, the outline, <coughs> you know, to, to your point about cohort, it's just really strange that you've got eighth grade doing twice as badly as fourth grade. I mean, these are the kids that are <coughs> moving through. I, you know, I, I wrestle with that. And the same with the math. That's know. consistent for years, too, when you've yeah. seen that. I thought we were aligned, Tim. When you said something about eighth grade science being a reflection of poor alignment, I That's what our I curriculum was aligned. No, our curriculum is not aligned in a whole lot of areas. We've told that it was aligned. <coughs> the information that this board has received for years, that the curriculum is aligned. 2014 was aligned to demarcation. I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at eighth grade, and our eighth grade students being successful in a whole lot of areas, and our teachers being good teachers. This is not a teaching issue. This is an alignment issue when we're this far off the mark. Then what were we told? I don't were know. Misled? Not, not deliberately. They're either aligned or they aren't. I mean, I don't know how you. How you, you but the other thing, and Dr. Krauser alluded to this or came out and said it, those standards for eighth grade science are changing. They're, the standards that they use to measure eighth grade science and, and fourth grade science are really, really dated standards. Well, are they the standards we teach? You know, we've been through this conversation. You can teach bad material as long as it's aligned to the test and the kids will do fine. It, it may not be what we want as educators, but if the material is aligned to the test and the teachers are teaching the material, this aligned material, then why would the kids not be able to pass it? Yeah, everybody's taking the same test across the state, so. Unless they're changing the standard in other words, what's on the test is not the standard that's in the in the curriculum. Somehow they're out of line. Right. How does that happen? I think you're itching to say something. Well, I have a I have a question. So uh, obviously, if for English and math, we have results from everything. We use tools on a regular, almost daily basis, telling us how our kids are going to do all these. Do we have that type of data, since we don't have any data between fourth and eighth for science, what do, what do we have to show us how they're lined up? Or is there no way to track that because there's no test? We, yeah, we do use a CDT for science. Um, to, to monitor that progress to find alignment. Um, and, you know, as, as Dr. Williams mentioned, there, there is some of a question because the, the performance the students are performing on the CDTs indicates that there should result in a higher level of proficiency. Um, so. I guess I have a hard time reconciling the eighth grade science number with the ninth grade bio number because the kids, like, consistently beat the daylights out of the bio exam. We share that. Confusion. Um, and then I assume that it was that was more diffuse a problem in the like you couldn't you couldn't isolate it to one anchor in the eighth grade science number the way you could with the sixth grade math. Yes, there aren't as many anchors in the science world. But it was all over as opposed to Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now there's some areas that were better than others and I haven't really dived into the eighth grade science as, as much as the sixth grade math. But um, there's, there's room for improvement in all of the anchors uh, for science for eighth grade. So how do you, if you say it's a curriculum issue, how do you adjust that? You look at the anchor results from the raw data from, from the PSSAs, and in like sixth grade math, for example, the glaring misalignment was in equations. Yeah. So then we talk to the math teachers and say, 
All right, here it is. This is showing where we're not doing as well as we should. And so, are you hitting this the way you should be hitting it? Well, and, and, I, and I'm reflecting on my experiences in a prior district with <coughs> biology, where biology was in the tank, and I laid it out for them where the weaknesses were in their biology instruction. And within a year's time, they turned that around. And actually, biology is now a strength in that district uh, because they looked at the, the results we showed them with, with the raw data and the anchors and where they were successful and where they are less successful. And they said, well, mitosis sticks in my head is one of the areas. Well, yeah, we don't hit mitosis very much. I said, well, it's a standard that has to be addressed. So that needs to change. And they changed it. And they were successful in changing it. So it's a process of pointing it out to them where the alignment's not happening and having them revamp that part of the curriculum. So if I'm hearing Joel correctly, we've been told in the past that we're aligned. I don't know who told you, who told us that. I would assume it's whoever was holding your chair. Information has come from as far back as I can remember, um, with one exception, and that was the transition between 14 and 15. Okay. That was when we took the dive off the deep end, and we knew we were we were told that our scores would go down, but that with this new alignment, they would come back up. Okay. That has not happened. So they continue to go down. You know. Being that you're, you know, a year and a half in now, as you've gone through this process, this to teachers, or at least you've had administrators present it, what is different to you from your prior experiences and what needs to be updated in order for us to align? We haven't displayed the weaknesses to the teachers just yet. Okay. That's coming. Okay. So are there process improvements that you see that would allow us to Not align yet. better. Okay. Not yet. Yep. See, I, I, I just get stuck on what's wrapping around sixth grade. I mean, they're doing remarkably better in fifth grade, pretty strong. All of a sudden, fifth, fifth grade falls apart. I got by seventh grade, they're doing great again. Not great, Joe. Well, better. Comparatively, <laughs> you know, twice as good. Which, what are you looking well, I'm, at? I'm just, I'm just looking at the percentiles, and I'm, I'm thinking they're, they're going from, you know, top 24 to half, then back up again. I'm looking at math. All right, I'm looking at the top line. Not to say the other is irrelevant, but the top line results aren't that much better. Yeah, look at the top line relative to the bottom line. Yeah, because, yeah, you know, if, if we look at it as a state cohort, we have to, we have to keep the bottom line in perspective. Correct. I'm not saying take it out, no, but don't you think that our primary concern is how well the kids are doing among themselves and against the standard? Yes, but perspective is always important. I understand that, and I'm not disputing that. So, but when I see, for example, the highest percentage in PA is also a piece of the perspective here. Correct. What does that tell you? A school that, that prides itself on excellent academic results, what, what we'd want to do is make sure we keep that in perspective as well. well what might that tell you if, if the, the highest Well, one of the things that tells me is that in sixth grade, for example, there's got to be at least one public school district where there's a tighter alignment of some sort. Agreed. And that the kids are performing against that better than our kids. Agreed. Who, who is it, and what can we learn from them? Agreed. And we're going to go down that path. But look at sixth grade and our performance and where we rank in the state and, and the percentage in the state. And look at eighth grade. Eighth grade and sixth grade have similar kind of number for performance. But look at where those numbers put us relative to the state in sixth and eighth grade. What indicator might what what might indicate that? I, I look at those numbers differently. It, to me, there's a consistent. I mean, our eighth grade ELA number, okay, we're top eighteen percent. It's still the second worst percent proficient advance that we have in Not ELA. In ELA hey, math and we're lousy in sixth time. grade. Yeah. I'm not saying that means anything, but it's there. I mean, the sixth grade obviously stands out in both of them. That's our worst in the ELA and math. Mm -hmm. That's our worst 
area. So that, that there's there's something to that, and we don't know about science. How do you, as an educator, feel about saying we got to get we get these numbers up because we're going to align to that specific curriculum? And that's I mean, you got to teach my my thesis and meiosis and really hit that because you didn't do well enough. On, are there not other? Do you know what I'm saying? There are other things in every curriculum area that maybe aren't on this test that are to learn too. But if in biology where they, they decide to teach about, uh, I'm just going to pull something out of the hat. Um, deciduous trees and how they pollinate or something and that's not on this not one of the standards why would why would we want to continue teaching that I think there's probably a lot of good things to learn that aren't not, on the not, not if not if they're going to be held accountable but that's what I'm saying the problem is we're being held accountable to things that may or may not be the only things in the world to learn uh, no argument there I mean that is it so a lifelong um, uh, educator, that has to really hurt somewhere along the line. I mean, yeah, every educator wants to see their kids in the, up in the 90% and all this wonderful thing, but there are other. We've had teachers in this district who had phenomenal extra units to teach to their children. When we started aligning it, they went out the window. It just couldn't do them anymore. Would I love to be a, a private school and, and make a determination about what we should be teaching our kids? Love it. Not the world we live in. That, yeah. That's what bugs me every year. That we're worried about this, and we haven't given them maybe access to other or exposed them to other educational experiences. That are well, let's not let's not forget though, English and math and science aren't the only things we teach. I get that. I get that. But there's an awful huge emphasis on them and how they rank us in the state. When we go to get ranked in the state, no one looks at our music programs or our athletic programs or anything else. No, but I would argue that those contribute to that. Absolutely, but nobody really, really, you know. Wait, 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 wait. Now, I, I, I hate that philosophy. The tests that have been determined to be by supposedly people that know or should know what is the important things to teach. Kind of like, you know, when I went to school, I learned to write in Carson. And determine that's not really important because no one's actually write anything that needs to be pretty in world type. So it's not it's not relevant. Do I think it's a good skill? Yeah, my kids know how to write in cursive. I, I think it does other things for their brains that that are important and for their motor skills. But in the grand scheme of their lifelong, you know, <coughs> not really that critical at the end of, at the end of the day, unless happen to believe that maybe it does, so they learn the right person. But that's to help them learn the other stuff. And that's my belief. That's not a, a belief that's held that, that it's worth that time, you know, to spend on that. And more. and that's okay. okay. That's that's evolution. So I, I mean what we teach, it does have to align with what they're testing on because someone has determined that that's what they need to know moving forward. I think we have to trust that. I mean, I don't think you teach them. You, I, I would hope we don't give them the, like, let's teach like a million questions that look exactly like the ones on the test so that our robots know how to answer those questions. I would hope that we teach the concepts behind those questions. And I think that's what we're doing. And I think that's what the Common Core is trying to get at. Yeah. But when and you look at that question and you see, like, hey, the kids didn't get that one. There's a flaw. Yeah. yeah, we're just not, we're not teaching something about what right. Seen there. right. right. And the well, assessments we give them probably aren't structured as much like that test question as they should be. So at least have familiarity with what the question might look like. They can solve for X, yeah. but not under that, not in that framework. That might be something you need to teach for a couple of days so that they, they get looking at the question. So they don't have those kind of questions in fifth grade? I mean, how those second grade. I mean, I mean, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you get this brain freeze, and you can do it in fifth grade, and you can do it in <coughs> seventh grade, but not sixth grade. Sixth grade, sixth grade your brain turned off. You're We're assuming the instrument is effective. Yeah. But the instrument is consistent across the state. Correct. Right. So, it's a, it's as effective on the east side and the west side. It's, it's and that's why I'm putting that in yeah, context. Yeah. 
I, you know, I'd, I think one other variable, in particular sixth grade, 66.6% .6 of the Department of Mathematics was new. So, you know, as Dr. Williams saying, there's, there's those components that we're looking to digest into that data. Outstanding teachers, but learning a process in a sequence is new. In the same row, 25% of the English department was new in sixth grade. Sixth grade transitioned five staff members last year in that process, and in the math department alone, two of the three were brand new to York Suburban. So that's a process that, you know, as we've been diving into the data, we're analyzing that alignment, you know, and, and, and we're seeing it, but there's also that instructional component of how that fits as, as, a, as a teacher component, which we've talked about before when we're bringing in new staff members, how we orient them to that process as well. So that's how it's a year issue and not a cohort issue. That's a hypothesis. Hypothesis that I've been, you know, tackling quite a bit with with the math department, with the, the middle school in particular. Got to pick a bone with you on that one. Mm -hmm. I think there's an awful lot to be said for challenges that new teachers face. However, if the curriculum is laid out, then it's not so much the curriculum as it is the ability of the teacher to internalize it and then teach it. Correct. And that's why, to me, that's just a possible variable. Um, we've been diving deep into the resources that were used, and if you see in seventh grade, it's where we implemented the open up, and that's where we saw the stop in that um, flow of mathematics, and that's what's being implemented this year to, to eliminate that, where it's clearly aligned, where, where the teachers are not pulling what we don't know to be rigorous and research-based resources beyond what's with already in the curriculum um, in an effort to bring that in so that doesn't, I think, by nature, some of that, again, a hypothesis on my end, and some of the conversation we have with the math department is, and I think I shared this with you before, in, in their efforts to help students, they're going out to find additional resources to help them ascertain those complex complex, uh, complex problems. Um, it's derailing that fundamental piece of, of what's essential for them to go. To Dr. Williams' point about where that alignment um, may shift or may adjust, um, but the curriculum itself is, is, is on par. We saw that in seventh grade. That's where we're putting in sixth and eighth grade. When you, when you say there was a lot of turnover, what are these, what are these like first-year teachers or experienced teachers first-year to us? Uh, first-year. One was first-year teacher and one was second-year teacher, first-year to us. See, that's, that's tough no matter whether you have the curriculum hammered out or not. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, no disrespect, but a first-year teacher Agreed. is going to have a rough time. Yeah. They've got to figure all the rest of it out not just the curriculum. Okay. Um, not just to show data on PSSAs and Keystones, uh, other data points that we have access to from PDE are ACT and SATs relative to the rest of the, P rest of the districts in the state. Uh, you can see, and this is 2018 data, that's the last data that they have for us um, statewide and York Suburban students perform, <coughs> outperform by a lot against the state average in both ACTs and SATs. Goal three, uh, to collaborate with outside organizations to promote well-being of students and staff. Um, Mrs. Hassenfuss has engaged uh, Lakeside Learning through a grant uh, who will be on March 13th delivering uh, trauma-informed instruction to all staff, not just teachers. Because let's face it, folks, the first line that some, some student has uh, who's going through a difficult time could be a bus driver, could be the cafeteria worker, could be the office secretary. So we've opened this up to all staff. Uh, the hourly folks who come will be paid. Um, and we're looking forward to uh, a long a good session on the 13th and an ongoing month-to-month -month, uh, follow-up sessions about trauma-informed instruction. Goal four, I hung out with the Motley Crew last Advocacy Day. You can see us up there. Um, and we have Advocacy Day coming up on March 23rd where we interact with legislators uh, that impact our world. So we're trying to engage them on a meaningful level uh, and uh, impact the legislation. Uh, the, the resolution that you'll be asked to vote on next meeting uh, is a, a, a byproduct of all of that. Uh, so we're looking forward to continuing with those efforts. All right. So the district goals of this year 
pretty well aligned with the goals in the comprehensive plan that Dr. Krauser just finished up and will be starting on July 1st of 2020. Um, you can see there's, I have green there that shows where we have good alignment with this year's goals and the, and the comprehensive plan goals and the yellow indicates, eh, it's kind of a fuzzy, fuzzy match. Um, so, but that's pretty good alignment considering uh, that the district goals were established before the comprehensive plan was finished. So that's a, that's a good sign. All right, we also surveyed parents. Uh, we had almost 500 responses, a fairly even distribution among uh, the grades. Uh, we had parents, uh, the low, lowest response rate was for fifth grade at 7.46% of the responses, and the highest was 13.10, and the others were all in between those two. They were asked to strongly agree, disagree, Strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree, and allowed for a Likert scale and a rating. Uh, they asked, we asked them questions about the school and their, their, kid, their particular child's school and the district in general. I'm not going to read through the survey questions that we asked, but those are the, they ask about uh, satisfaction in various areas. And when you aggregate, uh, when you uh, composite all that, for each of those buildings, the satisfaction rates are very high, Hot, four being the highest, obviously. And it's impossible to get a four. Yeah, I, I disagree with that. Okay. So when we survey at work, it's zero to ten. It's eight is considered. Three out of four on your scale is the, so the, the scores on the lower buildings, the three and a half averages, I'd say are, are pretty good. The, the middle school and high school averages right at three, they concern me because that's a lot of passive people. Now, we're not asking them to rate one to four, we're asking them to a state, giving them a statement saying that's strongly disagree, disagree agree or strongly agree. Okay. There's no middle ground. Deliberately, there's no right. middle ground. But a three is not the score you want. You don't want them to agree with the statement. You want them to strongly agree with the statement. An agreement is uh, I, I, what's considered a passive response. No, it's, it's I don't. Okay. I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say I disagree, because that's the next step. Why not? Well, you might say you disagree. If you really don't like it, you're going to say you disagree. If you gave them a binary you choice. agree is, is a passive response. It's yeah, your, your, ar your argument is a scale of 1 to 10 where you have more. Same thing with a scale of 1 to 5. I don't think so. I think it's 1 to 4. 1 to 4. This is a 1 to 4. A 1 to 5 scale, the only good score is a 5 also. A 4 is a passive response. But in a one to five scale, you're asking them to. Passive. It means they, if if you were a customer, you could take or leave the service. You just as readily. I go don't somewhere read else. it that way in, in res with respect to the questions that are. I don't, being I don't asked. either. I don't. I, I don't put the. Uh, those. Just schools. pick one at random. I feel welcome at this school, and you're saying agree is a passive response. Yeah. We should be concerned about just them agreeing. That's not where we want them. Well then, we want them to be, we want them to feel like it's the greatest place. In the what world. would you think the difference in our behavior is to elicit the second response? What would we have to do to get them to strongly I'm, agree? I'm just saying we should not be satisfied. That's living in the negative. What do we have to do to get that higher response? Whatever it takes to give them, get them to uh, say they on. strongly agree. Do we have to give them parties? Do we have to? One-on-one -on -one meeting. I get asked the same question at work all the time. What do I got to do to get a ten out of the customer? What's the seven, game? Eight? I got to make as much as I hate to say it. We're not competing for business the same way you are. It doesn't matter. The, the, the it does matter. I think it does. Like this, I think it does. Of course, it matters. The three is a passive. You uh, want those people. You want those people to be saying that they strongly agree with the statement. <coughs> I. Uh, I don't well, agree I guess with I would that say to me, passive is neither agree I, nor disagree. I know if I'm filling this out, if I'm not giving you a four, it's because I got something. I consider something not be 
as good as I Why wouldn't you choose disagree then? Why wouldn't you choose a disagree? I'm not saying it's a terrible place, but but I'm not willing to give you the four. Well, if it's a terrible place, it would be strongly disagree. Yeah. If you're getting a lot of threes, I'm just saying that's not really where you want to be. Actually, we're not getting a lot you of threes. You shouldn't be happy with three. Okay. You should only be happy with fours. You should strive for fours. No argument with that last statement, but the rest I take issue with. We'll fight it out later. Psychology of the survey. Okay, well, along the lines of responses that some people like and some people don't, uh, district-wide we ask various questions. Uh, and you can see the percentages of those responses and the weighted average for those responses, for those various things. Okay, so 2.5, my satisfaction with York Suburban School District is better than it was a year ago. Right. Any so anecdotal comments on that? If it was wonderful a year ago, we wouldn't... It went down. Change. If it's the same as it was a year ago, it would be. You know. I expect mm, roughly half to be on each side. That's what I would expect out of that question. But this is this is bending towards the disagree. No, it's bending towards the agree. You've got fifty-four percent agree or strongly agree. 46, 54. What am I missing? Am I looking at the wrong line? Weighted average. I'm looking at the weighted average. Now look at the percents. So about 46 in the negative and about 54, around 54 in the positive. Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of those questions that we could probably discuss for half an hour. Mm -hmm. I was totally satisfied last year, and I'm totally satisfied this year. So it isn't better, therefore I disagree with the statement. Okay. Well, thank you for the distribution. What are you going to do with that? On these, because it, it goes to the point raised earlier about the, which, God help me for raising this again, the point about the three earlier. You don't know that that three is mostly fours and two ones dragging the number down. Right. We right. need distribution. Yeah, line yeah I, I left it out just for brevity's sake. Right. Um, but I think I, I think I supplied that to, maybe I didn't supply Put that in the other, yeah. in the other yeah. information. Yeah. 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 I can't remember anymore. A couple weeks is kind of a blur. You know, I could strongly disagree with that statement because I'm totally satisfied one year to the next. That's fine. It, it right? just, it's so that, how do you? I mean, that's the lowest number I saw. Yeah, it's de it's definitely the lowest number. And I don't know. Just have an answer. All I'm looking for. <laughs> All right. So going forward, we have many challenges. Um, the biggest challenge of which is. One of the big challenges is academic programming, getting alignment, those kinds of things. I've got a few pictures up there to, to reflect various things that we're doing. Um, and so we have this, this, this academic program challenge. We also have some other challenges. We've got leaky pipes. <coughs> and money is not plentiful. So we've got several issues to deal with going forward. So. Another way to look at that is uh, in the form of a three-legged stool. One of the legs is educational programming, another one's finance, another one is facility. Um, the educational programming leg, uh, it's strong, it needs some polishing, some, some massaging, maybe some sanding, maybe some small cosmetic changes. Uh, the finance leg is starting to show signs of cracking and the facilities leg is starting to show signs of cracking. And now how are we going to address all those issues? Well, we're going to shore the stool up with some grade level realignment that's going to help in all three of those legs. That's how we're going to move forward in a, in a positive and cost effective way. So the roadmap that helps us along with that is the comprehensive plan and those four uh, goals in the comprehensive plan. And more of that will be revealed going forward. 
You see the word bold there. Bold is going to be a key component of the upcoming comprehensive plan and the rollout for that. That will be rolled out via social media and in some cases more traditional print media. Hence the Gutenberg. the Gutenberg kind of press there. So one of, one of the things I struggle with, suppose I could magically pick all of the kids up in their high school, move them over and put them in a brand new school, completely renovated, all the new stuff. The argument is that scores and performance would increase because, you know, if I, if I think about that, you know, it, is that what we're saying? Because if it is, I have trouble with that. <laughs> but I don't think that's what we're saying. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, you're what's old? making you think that? I, I, I guess I guess when I when I start thinking about the stool, you know, yeah. you know, we kind of laugh about this. It says, uh, you know, we're going to show off the academic program, but that's only successful if we do the facilities and we do the, you know, is it? Are they really that tightly integrated? You know, there's yeah. A, I don't know, there's an auxiliary assumption in there somewhere that the facilities are some sort of constraint. Yeah. That it's a relaxation Thank of a yeah. constraint. So yeah. it only works in one direction. It's like you, if you push on a string, you don't get a result. But if you right. pull on a string, you do get a result. So are the facilities the binding constraint? Because they don't behave that way otherwise. We've been told that at the elementary levels they are. But by not having the grades aligned from K through 5, we're creating issues, some of which can be mitigated by realigning those grades. I can, I can accept that, that, that for some of them. From yeah. 6 on up. We're already aligned. Not as well as we could be from 6 on up. Well, they're in the same building. Yes, but 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 in one general location is a better way to align those grades. I go along with your use of the word tweak on that one as opposed to what goes on in the lower grades. Agreed. Pulling them literally into the same facility where they're not now. And that that shores up the finances if we get the economy and the teaching staff that we think we'll get. Correct. But I guess I'm less convinced at the higher levels. I'm not opposed to it, but I'm not. I'm not as convinced that having what would what would it be six, six through twelfth, seventh seven through twelfth, all on the same campus. Yeah, because we can more adequately share resources. Certification-wise, the certifications okay, are seven to twelve. Sense. Okay. Yeah. You know, so we can share. Conceptually, we could now, but it's a logistical nightmare. We'd have to put somebody in the car and pay them to drive from here to I'm there. Not going to beam them from one school right. to the other. Right. Not with Mount Rose. <laughs> no, especially not now. It's yeah. to be a little bit more of a problem. I think we could build a bridge yeah. faster. <laughs> Seven years later. So I don't. I don't want to stand you know, here and you know, tell you, know, you that you know, new facilities are going to yeah. improve student achievement. That's none of us are saying that. None of us. That's not. That's not a reason to build a, a new facility. I see aging facilities that we need to do something about. And grade level realignment gives us the opportunity to restructure things physical plant wise and financially and contributes to more uh, better implementation of the academic program. It's to my mind the only path forward. I mean another way to think about it is if you're sucking resources to the facilities, one leg's getting shorter and the other one's getting somewhat short up, the stool gets out of kilter. So that's the state of the district report. Okay. Well, we beat you up all through it. Questions, comments? No. <laughs> well, I, I have a question. In the picture with the legislators, why are they smiling and you're not? Because I'm standing with legislators. You and, you and Joel and Rich. <laughs> why are they smiling? Well, let's stand sailor, man. Wow. That's why we're smiling. It's painted on. I didn't want to be. They just said, line up, boys. We're going to take a picture. Free will is dead. Look at my expression, Ellen. Free will is dead. I look like I'm going to the dentist. <laughs>
<laughs> That's a very bad advertisement for your thing. We were All right. Yes, and uh, I think we'll. Uh, Beth, are you ready to? You no, know, I think we'll we'll move you around a little bit and have you go next so that you don't have to stay for the for the duration. Uh, Crabtree Rohrball Architects are here to uh, share with us um, design and build a school construction projects uh, and the trends in those areas. And I'll turn it over to Seth. Um, I'm going to be using this Do you need this? Um, familiar with several faces here. I am Seth Wentz. I'm mm -hmm. Crabtree Railroad Associates. Mm -hmm. And today, ooh, yes, just transfer it over here. Mm -hmm. um, today, I brought with me a couple of my colleagues, John Padilla. Emmy, um, we are a team that work together to create these projects. What you see might be my face, but what happens behind the scenes is a whole group of people that work together. Um, Emmy is interiors. Uh, she has been a part of this project. Uh, you, this is the first time you're seeing her, but she's been a part at many of the meetings and has uh, really pushed the uh, design of this forward. John is one of the managing partners of the firm. He has been assisting throughout the entire process and provides guidance along the way. Um, we've been asked to come in and give a presentation on trends in the education environment. Um, and that's what we have here today. We'll do some introductions. We'll talk about uh, understanding visions, uh, go through some visual listening, project examples, and answer any questions you might have. Um, John, would you like to talk just a little bit about the firm? Sure. Well, I can't think of a better segue with your stool talking about facilities. Um, I think what we just wanted to demonstrate, the, the bulk of the work that we do, about 70% is K-12 work kind of throughout the tri-state area. And if anything, what that has taught us is kind of a unique listening approach because we learned that every district is very unique. And the goal of the process is to um, find out what is unique about your district and have the architecture or the facilities support your program. And we're going to talk a little bit about the process that we go through to help identify the unique aspects, the attributes of the existing buildings, how to reuse existing space perhaps in a different way, multi-use spaces, and then talk about how what we see uh, learning changing, and not just in public education, but we do corporate architecture, and so how students are being prepared for moving either into the workplace or onto higher ed. So lots of different subjects to kind of just generate some ideas about all. And what we're sharing today, these are trends that we're seeing across the spectrum. Um, these are ideas and concepts. Uh, we were asked to come and present this because you guys are entering into a process or consideration of a process and we were asked to kind of bring to the forefront what we're seeing across the state, um, what's happening in education, and what you might be interested in considering in the future. So, like John had mentioned, one of the most important things is to understand the client's vision. You know, we can come in and say, hey, this is a great example of a project and you should totally do this, but if it doesn't match your goals, that's a useless suggestion. So the first thing we always try and do is make sure that we fully understand what the project goals are, what the client's visions are, what the students need, what the, the teachers need. Um, and, and moving forward through that is a critical part. Um, the instructional landscape is changing. You know, it used to be the, uh, the general classroom, the computer lab, the large group specialty spaces. Um, we've been seeing that dissolve. I mean, how many people go to a computer lab anymore? It's almost non-existent. Uh, you might have computers set up inside a classroom for a particular task, inside a media center for a particular task. You don't have the traditional computer lab I grew up with. Uh, you're not being taught how to type on the keyboard and, and track your speed and all that kind of stuff. That's going out the window. What you do have in this place is a different type of education. 
You know, it used to be those pieces were all separated. You know, you learned in one room, went to the computer lab for something else, large group instruction, uh, and then you had some outdoor component that may or may not exist on campus. Normally it's that courtyard that nobody ever maintains. Not talking about you, Barry. <laughs> Um, but it becomes a leaf catcher a lot of times. So really what we've been observing is the blending of those lines. You know, you don't have a space that is specifically one thing anymore. You have spaces that are multifunctional. You have spaces that are not just sitting there at a computer. You have a space that is a touchdown for a certain section of the time and you move to another station, you're doing something else, you move to another station and you're interacting in another way or completing a task. It needs to be, the educational environment needs to support that type of education process. So back to how do we get the information? You know, what is a, there's a whole box of tools that we have. Um, John, Emmy and I have gone through what we call a visual listening exercise. Um, it is a system that use, is used across the country, and it's an extremely effective um, way of pulling information out of people and trying to formalize that into something everybody can understand. It's a really simple concept. You know, the graphic here kind of describes it. You get groups of people together. Groups of people can be any sort of group of people. You could have students and teachers. You can have school board members and facilitators. You could have the general public, a group of the general public brought in along with another group of board members. The idea is that you have the groups evaluate pictures on the wall. They're all put up there, they can be on boards, they can be individual pictures, and everybody's given green dots and red dots in this case. They can be <coughs> color. But the idea is that one dot represents I like this, another dot represents I don't like this. Seems like a really simple concept. But what you get out of it is a trove of valuable information. Now, we don't just take those pieces of paper and then go back and put it in the file. You end up, at the end of that exercise, having a full-blown conversation about what people like <coughs> and what they don't like. And what we end up doing is, right here on the slides, we start marking in that conversation. I just did this recently at a school district uh, out in Lancaster. We had the students uh, do their evaluation. And then we talk to the students. Teachers are in the same room, keep, keep in mind. Talk to the students. What do you like about this? They're talking about you know, the need for natural daylight in this space. They're talking about the need for these collaborative learning areas that they were able to present. They're talking about things that matter to them. They like to be seen and be able to see other people. Now, it's interesting because then the teachers took a swipe at it, and the students sat back and listened. It's interesting because the teachers liked the same exact things. Not in every case. You know, teachers came at it from a different standpoint. But the important thing is, at the end of that exercise, we were able to create a set of guiding principles that helped us make decisions moving forward in the process. It helped us realize what spaces they actually wanted, zones they wanted to teach in, what kind of relationships between the spaces mattered. And that really helps form what becomes a project in the end. And this is where it all comes together. You know, you take, okay, these are the most important pieces coming out of that exercise. And you're able to pull that together into a document that says, this is what we need to ask ourselves at the end. If every, every time you get to a juncture and you say, you know, we just don't know if we need this program or if we don't need this program, you have something to go back to and say, okay, we had strong support in this direction. I think we have something we should go with. Emmy, did you want to talk a little bit about um, the use of furniture and, uh, and using some existing spaces? Yeah, I think to Seth's point, we're seeing a lot of those um, more traditional uh, spaces that are blurring into a, you know, more of those group, small group collaboration, large group collaborations that give uh, the building a lot of flexibility instead of having children or the student sitting in rows, you're not seeing rows and rows of furniture anymore. Um, you may see in a classroom similar to what you have here, you might see tables and chairs versus desks and chairs. Uh, you obviously kind of develop 
you know, what you're seeing in here, you're able to move this around for different functions. That's really what we're looking at through furniture within these spaces. So um, while an existing building may not have some of these flex spaces, there are ways that we can introduce the concept into your existing spaces. Um, but I think you'll see further into the program how we can utilize your existing building and create those open collaborative spaces without you know, expanding beyond the footprint of what you have existing. So we share these images mostly because these are traditional classrooms. You know, it's what you see all across the state. Um, and again, it's not necessarily that you have to change everything. It's that you can integrate new concepts into your existing space to help facilitate some of these concepts. Okay, so this is what I grew up with, what most of us grew up with. This is uh, what I've been uh, referred to in the office as the kind of cells and bells. You know, there's a particular place, it's a one size fits all. You learn in this room, you go to the next room, you learn in that room, and it doesn't really take into account the education program. It says the education program is going to fit into that space. And it really relies on the four R's. I actually had to look this up when I first started in this because reading, writing, and arithmetic is called the four R's, and I thought it was a joke at first. It really is the four R, the three R's. Um, so, you know, that was the focus. Reading, writing, and arithmetic, everything fit in there. Uh, passive learning, uh, conform to each one of these spaces. And really, what we're seeing now is more of a focus on the four C's. And that's critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity. So the building, this is the same exact corridor, just configured in a different way. You, know, you have the connection to the outdoor here. You have these nodes that allow for collaboration. You have the ability to uh, open up spaces into other spaces, combine classrooms, uh, have views from the corridors into those rooms, which promotes safe environments, anti-bullying. And it really provides a lot of opportunity. Now, I know this group has bought into this concept in the past. Yorkshire Elementary is an example of a space that has a lot of some of those collaborative learning areas. When you have students that go to that school, I'm sure they appreciate that kind of space. I'm sure it allows those teachers to teach in a different way. The images there, those are some examples of spaces that could uh, exist in some of these areas over there. Um, some concepts that are employed, you see garage doors or uh, folding walls. You know, those allow the ability to open up into the corridor, allow the ability for education process to spill out into other spaces. You have the collaborative learning areas, that's this image in the middle, as it relates to uh, this part of the graphic over there. That allows for group instruction, that allows for breakouts of students. You don't have that student sitting in the desk right outside side the door anymore, uh, just kind of in the hallway. You have a zone for that student to actually learn, collaborate, mark boards, technology. Uh, it's actually built into the program. And then similar up here, you have the ability for that type of exercise to spill out. I think the one comment, just I'm just looking at that second image, is um, that this school particularly was a high school and we probably had four or five of these collaborative spaces throughout the building and, and some of the teachers are really unsure of how they were going to use these spaces, how they were going to function, what in the world were they going to be doing in these spaces. And after being in, I think they've been in the building for two years now and the feedback is that we should have put more in. So it's really um, a different process, a different way of thinking, a different way of learning which they, you know, the younger generation has been learning all their life and it's what we're preparing them for. We've also gotten, we work with some higher ed clients um, and they're asking us to, you know, ex um, they're asking us to pass on this information as far as what the expectation is when they do finally get to that higher ed. Are they aware? Are they being instructed this way? Are they comfortable in these learning environments? Because that is what is, you know, ultimately where this is kind of trickling down from. It's trickling, um, as John mentioned, it's in, um, in corporate world, these more flex uh, learning or collaborative spaces where you're not just tied to an office or a cubicle all day long, that you have these different zones where you can do different activities. So it really is kind of the norm in most of the environments and more that we're seeing. 
So another graphic example, the same type of concept. Um, you have the main corridor going through the space, you have all the classrooms off of it, uh, and the idea that you can transition that space into something more collaborative and more interactive um, and allow for those opportunities. So a key point with that is <clears throat> that is the same square footage. It's rethinking how to utilize that same square footage. It's not about more. That head count neutral? I mean, if you look at the one on the top and then you go to the one on the bottom, do I support the same number of bodies? Uh, you could argue, based on your program, you might support more, depending upon the, the um, exercise, the effort, program. Okay. It's a graphic of one of the projects we did recently. Um, this really describes the importance of scale. So we talk about these collaborative spaces. If you have a group of 15 students that want to go do an exercise or, or have a group of five students that need to get together and collaborate, those are two very different spaces. You know, having a, an auditorium or, you know, what we currently use as the lobby of the high school, um, that may or may not suit what those students are trying to do. What this describes is that you have small group spaces, you know, uh, little nodes off the main corridor that are able to seat one to four people groups. You have slightly larger spaces that are fit in the, the 4 to 12 range. You have a whole class type of collaboration, the 12 to 25. And then if the, uh, the district sees the value in it, you could have large group instruction spaces that fit the 25 to 90. Now that's important to keep in mind because there's different styles of learning, there's different styles of collaboration that happen in each one of those. And through the process of working um, through your program, you would then start realizing, okay, this is the best use of this space. This is exactly what we want. Or, hey, we don't have a use for a 25 to 90. We have this other space over there that we can utilize. So in looking at those, it's the consideration of uh, what's the best use of your space and what are the best goals. Um, up to this point, any questions? We're going to go through some examples, some uh, pictures. We talked about a couple of the principles of collaboration and how it can be executed. Is this some of the, the so course we need a card? I mean, do the schools decide uh, this is what they want and then they're going to figure out how to get the instructional? John? Uh, it happens jointly. I mean, I think a lot of times um, the architecture is catching up, um, but it's more about marrying the vision with the design that meets the program. All, all those moves should be supporting and that's what's really unique about the guiding principle approach. When you as a board, as an administrative uh, team, say, these things are important, equity, program, uh, whatever those things may be, whenever we <coughs> propose a solution or concept, you should be able to look at that design and see those guiding principles in some shape or form. Or, back to your three-legged stool, if it becomes a budget issue, you recognize that because you're talking about each and every one of those components along the way. So it is a process that should be integrated. Uh, I, will, I would say that we have yet to see a design solution change a program. It's the other way around. We're designing a program, but we're, we're thinking about how these spaces should be designed to support the program and, and what your vision is. <coughs> I just wonder whether the teachers that talk in terms of, you know, in collaborative spaces and small spaces and big spaces and all this kind of stuff, you know, are, are we building it because that's the direction we want them to go in, or are we doing it because that's the direction the faculty thinks we And it takes time to get there, obviously, we're going to have to do it one day and making all these collaborative spaces. I think actually, this is the first example of Ambridge. Mm -hmm. It is. <clears throat> that's, uh, that, that's a good segue to this piece. So neighboring uh, school district, Elizabethtown, um, this was a very small school, 200 kids, but administratively um, what the admin team wanted to do was break away from a traditional model driven by the Department of Education's planning. We showed you what those models look like, um, the numbers of spaces to fit numbers of students. And what they chose to do was um, assemble, uh, they pulled their uh, key staff out of three or four buildings, the people that 
they felt um, had established themselves in the district could progressively think about program and offer ideas about um, making it known where were the buildings restricting certain things. Was it size? Was it heating and cooling? Was it the lack of daylighting? Um, was it accessibility of space on the second floor versus the ground floor that you couldn't go outside? So that core team started to, started to assemble their educational vision, which then we started interacting with and showing ideas and concepts. And so here's the, here is the um, existing condition of the school where um, you know this L-shaped configuration from a building organization uh, and a K-5 grade alignment had, it was disjointed. There were kids at one end of the building that really didn't see kids at the other end of the building. Um, the proposed additions, those two wings, and the relationship between the two uh, became an outdoor educational space. So I, I would say that there were opportunities along the way that everyone jointly saw, you know, what if by having access to those spaces, they actually opened up to one another that students could move freely, and how do you address security if you do that? So it is a collaborative process. Um, as you move through the process, you can see how each of the two wings now um, really are somewhat linked to each other, and that outdoor classroom has the flexibility to um, have students even move furniture if they choose to, based on um, furniture selections and the mobility of them, uh, to move one another. Uh, the other thing the district actually said they wanted to do was if they felt like a third grade student near the end of the school year was ready to um, start you know, assimilating to some of the fourth grade program, they didn't want to feel like that person was leaving something. And so by having a more open, um, collaborative environment, it was a very fluid, and that's what they kept describing, we want the students to feel like this is a fluid movement. and. If a particular child is excelling and they're ready to go, then they go. Um, but they feel like they're part of that larger group. So here's how the you know the <coughs> architect tried to respond to that. And we went through many iterations of this till we all felt like it addressed their program and their budget. And here, here are the final results where you can see um, the large glass daylit areas that are clabber spaces open to the outdoor space. And you know, this is kind of a layering concept that illustrates um, the area of the building and the flexibility that you could um, interchange groups, programs, um, curriculum, because you were no longer restricted to, I only can teach science in this space because that's the only place that there are science labs, uh, as an example. Um, and I think this graphic is important. We were talking about the ability to open up rooms to have free-flowing access to each other. Um, this really shows it from the most closed version of it to the most open version of it. So this classroom that you see up here on the floor plan over here is that classroom. That classroom has a wall to the corridor and it has a folding wall in between it and the adjacent room. If those teachers, like John was saying, if you have math curriculum being taught at the third and the fourth grade level, and you decided to take that wall down between the rooms, you could have a third grade student being educated at the fourth grade level when they are prepared for it and still not leaving their peers. So that opens up a whole, you're we talking, you're asking about, you know, is this the, the cart driving the horse? Mm -hmm. um, that happens in today's world, it's just they have to leave their room, go to a whole different class of people they don't know, and then return at the end of that curriculum event. Or there's a notion of a student that, you know, you have a breakout session where um, they're sitting outside the classroom. That happens mm -hmm. statewide everywhere. Um, so you lose supervision, but most importantly too, that district said, I feel like that we're losing that student. They're, they're being removed from the class, so having the flexibility to, to maintain supervision and that student still feeling like they're part of that class without isolating them. And the notion of the corridor, learning is occurring everywhere. and. So this is a thoughtful process to um, implement that or allow that to happen. You can see as the diagram progresses, um, the wall here between the classrooms and the corridor, that can dissolve as well, opening up to that collaboration space. The same thing happens on either side of that collaboration space with those two classrooms. To the extent that if you decided to open every single folding wall and every single operable element, you could have one connected space. Now, I know that makes some people in this room have angst. So 
so we have some images to go along with it. This is that exact floor plan, and it does not feel like one giant unprogrammed space. You, know, you do have the collaboration space that looks out to the courtyard. You have the flexible furniture there that encourages group learning. And you do have the education uh, instructional space ability. This is that wall to one of the flanking classrooms to the collaboration space. The ability to, to dissolve that wall, to have that class flow into that, uh, it creates a lot of opportunities. It's not just limited to that one area. The same, this is that classroom that has a folding wall that can combine into two, two classrooms into one, I mean. It has the ability to open up as well. This is that same classroom from the inside, the folding partition is here. And you can see how an instructional space can be a, a nice free-flowing instructional space, not just the traditional, you know, one room fits multiple subjects. Uh, it's that same school, the media center of that school, and showing the different uh, different types of arrangement that can happen there as far as the types of learning. It's kind of hard to see with the light, but they're actually learning the technology over there in the corner, um, why you can have small group instruction happening at another spot, and you can have independent learning happening in uh, fun and elementary creative ways. John, do you have anything you want to say about Wine Creek on this one? Um, well, you'll see a different building organization. This is a, a, a much larger, and I think what we want to talk about is elementary examples, middle school examples, high school examples, because your guiding principles ought to reflect all of those. Uh, and then we, you apply them to each of the facilities to see what uh, the merits are. But this building was organized more about a, a common main street that separated the academic wings from uh, the public zones, the high occupancy areas, the cafeterias, and so forth. But also thinking about visibility and transparency throughout all of these spaces um, to deter uh, bullying and, and have spaces more inviting with daylighting. And again, the flexibility of uh, each of these nodes at the end of an academic wing draws students and, and staff out into the end of each of these wings that is visible from the main street. So it creates a lot of activity in a highly visible spot, and kids are always poking in and seeing what are they doing, or what's the next group doing, or what's happening in that next learning pod. So it's about creating that interest and, and getting the students to be involved. I mean, did you, uh, these are two different, very different um, furniture layouts within the same space. I mean, as you're, you're seeing, there's obviously lots of different types of furniture and that's really again guided by your direction and how you're envisioning those spaces but really the, the, the manufacturers um, have done a great job of trying to give you lots of options uh, to utilize within these spaces again it can be as formal as something a desk and chair or tables and chairs and as playful and uh, as you can get with a beanbag chair so there are lots of different opportunities within that. I think there's um, another couple photos within that. Again, standard chairs and uh, tables, lounge furniture. Um, you'll see coming up there's um, a lot of technology integrated into these types of furniture. So if you're doing small collaborative groups that kids can come in, if they're working on a project as a team, that technology is linked there and all of their devices can link together. So there really are um, <clears throat> as many options as you want to look at and how you envision these spaces. But again, any place that you're going to go is an opportunity to either learn or be instructed or yourself learning in this space. Transition to middle school level. Um, Again, the same concepts apply, so we're not going to dive into every little detail. Um, this was uh, this image I like. It, it did kind of drive home that connection in nature. You know, having those areas where you're able to do some uh, impromptu outdoor learning. And this lab district was very um, specific about their um, in between their classroom rings. They really developed those spaces to really have an educational environment outside. So they did include. Um, 
two or three different concepts within that, but you may have also had, we've done chalkboards outside so we can have those interactive learning environments within that if they're going to be that um, specific, but also giving you the creativity to use those, not just with a specific science, but again, cross-learning between different disciplines and being able to use those spaces outside. Is that a new building? That was. Can you give us an idea what that one cost? Uh, the prior elementary school was uh, 27 or 28 million, and I do not know the middle school off the top of my head. But it's large, it's like 1,400 kids. Uh, in Cumberland, we did a combined bid. Both schools were constructed across the street from one another at the same time. Uh, so they needed to catch up quite a bit for capacity. Um, so they were both done uh, simultaneously. So that visual listening exercise and those guiding principles were imperative to be able to do both of these at the same time. But this uh, the next slide um, that Seth went to, this superintendent had a very specific vision before we even started talking about it, knowing what they wanted to do. And that was, I'm not interested in building a traditional family consumer science lab, health classroom, um, and arts. I want to integrate all of those spaces put them at about normal classroom size, maybe 900 to 1,000 instead of 1,400. Took that residual square footage and developed it into the collaborative space in front. So all of those spaces open, and this is really a project-based learning lab where all of those spaces have the ability and flexibility to move students very fluid in and out of those spaces. Um, we love the example the superintendent gave of how he wanted the student to develop a chocolate bar. He wanted his consumer science students and nutrition to study the nutritional content and value and, and what, what would be in the bar. He wanted the art students to develop the wrapper for marketing. Uh, and then he wanted the CNC students in the lab to develop the mold to fabricate it and someone to sell it. These are, this was how he described the vision for the program that we went through several gyrations of the design until we got it right programmatically, the right adjacencies, and an efficient use of the square footage. And I really like this example. What you've seen so far has a lot to do with furniture and the, the soft seating and those kind of things. It's not a one-size-fits-all. You know, what this actually is, that space, that long one, it's this collaborative learning area. There are openings along this wall that go directly into those classrooms. There's garage doors over here that allow those students to flow out onto a paved area that they can do their work outside as well. This is an example of that garage door opening into the adjacent space. This is the, uh, the art room here. So the furniture is uh, a little more fixed, um, but it's still flexible to the learning environment, what they're deciding to teach or work on that day. As opposed to the, uh, the CNC room that John's talking about, where they're doing more hands-on activities, because these tables, they're actually on casters, so that group, if they're going off and doing a group activity, they can actually roll their entire workstation out into that collaboration area and take advantage of that space. So again, I don't want this group to have the impression that the answer is always, let's put a whole bunch of lounge furniture in there and it'll just work. It's not that simple. It's really understanding the program and what the goals are and creating a space that fits to those visions. And we'll quickly go through some of the high, uh, some of the high school stuff. <coughs> John, are there any fun stories you want to share on State College? Uh, this was seven years from start to finish. This was the uh, past referendum. Um, it took us through a planning for about 2,400 students that uh, was a fully occupied building, and it was probably about 600,000 square feet until we were finished. But the scale and those same guiding principles uh, were very similar to a school of four or five hundred kids, and they became unique to driving the design criteria for each of uh, each of the projects. How much did that one cost? Pretty so, ballpark. Uh, one hundred and twenty-five million. Mm -hmm. So, but the cost for square footage wasn't more than. Uh, whether yeah. Before we moved yeah. on to the high school, I wanted to point out the examples of what we're showing you. Um, the both new schools for uh, Cumberland Valley, the elementary school, the middle school, are projected to be the lowest cost per square foot schools built in the entire state of Pennsylvania. Uh, they're new construction, but 
um, that, that's something that we were proud of that allowed the district to uh, undertake both of those projects simultaneously. Now I share this image because I know uh, a lot of people at this table have a knee-jerk reaction to what's called the Taj Mahal. And we're not proposing that you create spaces that are exactly this large. Now this is a part of State College. And State College program with the, what was the student body for that one, John? 2,400. 2,400 students had justified a space like this. But if you strip this down to its bare essentials, you're talking about multiple collaborative learning spaces. You have the sit-downs, you have the flexible boards, you have some of the lounge happening around it. Uh, and, you know, everything else that comes along with it, you had to have a space that could fit that many students, that could flow that many students. This space right here is no different. You have the flexible learning, you have the, uh, the multiple arrangements of seating, you have the marker boards that are flexible, you have the, uh, the collaborative learning areas. It, it has all the same flexibility. So I don't want this group to get scared and say, okay, this is always going to cost a ton of money. There are going to be spots that, yes, you do want to spend money, and yes, you do want to make a statement, and you want to have that. But it's not to say these concepts are exclusive to those concepts. And of course, whatever you do, you want to make sure you have a sense of identity within the building. Um, again, this was State College. With as large as it was, it was decided that there were going to be um, uh, graphic identification elements. It was done through color and it was done through letters. And each one of those, you kind of enter into that wing and you're able to have a little kind of touchdown space, that, that little in-between space for each one of those areas. That's, again, used as an educational space, but it's also used um, uh, used for relaxation and collaboration with your students. And the space adjacent to that was a faculty room, so there was that transparency and whether, um, you know, the kids were there or not, it's still kind of see and be seen so that they, you know that that faculty is there and that's their space. So there's always still that supervision and that monitoring throughout that, the entire space. So this kind of concludes what we're seeing, you know, some of the major trends that we're seeing in the region right now. Um, open it up to questions. Uh, I thought, you know, we were invited in to, to give this kind of presentation. Um, you know, some of you may know, I have a son going through the system. I have another one that will be going through the system. Um, I am excited at the fact that, you know, this group is having these conversations. And I wanted to make a point to make sure the group had the best information at their fingertips in making some of these decisions. Yeah, I have one. In, in looking at uh, all these schematics and spaces and the uh, mention of collaborative, flex zones, uh, different styles of learning, independent learning, I'm going on the premise from what, from what you presented that um, class sizes aren't cast in stone anymore, are they? I mean, just looking at those collaborative spaces, I mean, it, it looks like small class get big all of a sudden or it could shrink or it, it's kind of a moving target. Is that accurate to say? It, it um, you know, the state college example is a good uh, example because of being so large. Uh, there are four of those three-story towers and in each of those learning communities um, there are four, I believe four different size classrooms. <coughs> they wanted to have the flexibility in the space to, if they wanted a smaller group, they didn't want to put 12 or 14 kids in a room that would require 30 kids. So they felt like they broke down their three class, their ideal classroom sizes, um, and then they would schedule appropriately around that. So they, they maneuvered through um, that whole discussion to arrive at three or four different types of classroom sizes. So but the idea is they could go up to a class of 30. Yes. Maybe even larger. Sure. You know, they had one class within each of those pods that would fit two classes, two full classes. Um, and then that open collaborative area probably fit three classes within that. So it really is, you know, if you're bringing their philosophy was trying to go to that no home base. So that was another uh, direction that the district wanted to do was a teacher did not have a home base. They were kind of traveling more so like he was in a higher education that 
it's just a classroom and these are the activities and this is what I need to be doing today and tomorrow I may be doing this or in the next hour I may be doing this. So they really were looking for as many variables and, and class sizes as they could. So as John mentioned, they went down to a small group room that could be you know, up to 10 or 12 people. Um, and actually, they had some smaller, just one, one or two, or I guess maybe four person areas that you could, you know, if a student was taking a test, they could be pulled in there, or if they needed a one on one, they could be pulled in there. So it was really, again, trying to give, you know, the spaces that teachers are needing and not having the kids sit out in the hall to take a test, that they could physically go in and focus on their test and not have kids, you know, interrupting them. So it was, um, as John said, they really, had a you know a path that they were trying to uh, get to, and we did have some teachers that weren't totally on board, and they struggled for a little bit to you know release that more traditional component. But I think you know we've heard good feedback from them. I think everybody's more on that path than they were you know before they moved into the building, seeing how flexible they were and how much you know that they could utilize those spaces. The kids at these schools, their test scores are, are okay? They're going up, not down? <laughs> that discussion all of you had, I don't think we were qualified to answer that. Don't know. But, uh, no, no, they didn't go up, or no, you're not going to answer it. <laughs> Do you collect utilization data? You go back and look at the way these spaces are actually utilized relative to, to the design intent. Uh, yeah, I, I think the feedback we get, um, you know, let me mention the one about Middletown. During the programming phase, I think the administration team talked about their high school wanted to have these open collaborative spaces. We heard from other staff members, you guys are nuts. They're unsupervised, they're open. Who's gonna watch them? What about vandalism? All those things. And little by little as you know, the project was finished and now they're two and three years into it, they wish they had more. Students are using the spaces beyond, I think, what everyone envisions, and they're going to a scheduling system now where, kind of like a higher ed model, that they're blocking time out for students that want to plan group meetings to organize and schedule your own time so you have that space. Um, so there's things that we learned from the touring, um, but it's hard to compare when you look at a state college model where they were separate um, by a road on, on Westerly Avenue. The ninth and 10th grade was separated from 11th and 12th, and every classroom changed 2,000 students across the street. So to comparatively analyze before to today, but we do know today that you know, the shape of that building was specifically driven by the concern we heard, how are we gonna have students recognize the teaching staff with you know, 2,400 students and not developing a long linear building that you may never even see someone on the opposite end. That's kind of where really the U shape, it, it draws students into each of the learning communities that you're coming into those areas. So I have to imagine the utilization is very high because they strategically planted certain programs in certain areas. Like Emmy mentioned, the faculty resource area is at the beginning of each of these nodes in the corridor. So they were thoughtful about um, the same components that are in every building, but where they were placed in relationship to where the students were, to try to create that interaction. I guess I'd say my, not biggest, but one of my biggest concerns is that we're talking about, I mean, whether it's 125 million or 25 million, every time these, these things are planted in the ground, there's an expectation that they'll last forever. You know, that, in other words, we're not thinking about next year's teaching model or 10 years down the road. And you can look at, at areas where, for example, it may be the fact that we have school district level decisions instead of higher level decisions made by counties or by states. Uh, just cite the Denver area school district in Colorado. There are buildings that are 90 years old in that school district. They're beautiful, well-maintained, classical architecture with fixed walls that match the footprints that you showed in some of your first slides. And they're just as functional today as they were then. Do they meet the model? I don't know. I don't know that they've gone through that, that kind of discussion process. But to take a decision like that to that school board in a city of 2 million is a whole lot different than taking it to a school board where the population of the district is, is making those decisions within such a small footprint. 
I'm concerned about that. You know, today's perfect solution, what does it look like 10 years from now? We talk about acknowledging or accommodating today's technology. If we were having this conversation 10 years ago or 15 years ago, there wouldn't be USB ports, there wouldn't be smartphones, there wouldn't be any of that. We would be building computer labs, thinking that's the wave of the future. So I'm very concerned about planting the, the stake in the ground and saying, by golly, it'll last how long? 50 years? 60? 80? Yeah, it's, 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 th this is part of the process of a board establishing what are the what are important to you as your guiding principles. Because as architects, um, we cannot appreciate well, I understand that. what we did You respond to the needs that, that are given to you. Yeah. But there are, you know, some of the adjustments, I think, too, that we see from the corporate side of what we do, the work environment is, is changing. It is there. Our office is very much like that. So to see how, um, at a high school level, a student that might just go to a technical school and go right into uh, learning Revit to learn how to draw buildings, they're going to be in that collaborative environment. And over the last 25 years, I can see when interviewing a candidate of someone that might have a stellar portfolio to show me their work, um, which is indistinguishable between when you used to draw with your hands, which I'm old enough to say I did that. But you can tell their ability to um, talk through a problem, um, to rationalize something, or to talk about something other than what they were there for, that they're immediately kind of out of their element. Those are things that I hear from educators that happens in these buildings at an earlier age, where they learn to uh, work on problems together, build things together, um, and then translates to uh, the, the workplace. Some of the trends that we have seen just over the last five to seven years, you're building less and less into to try to make it future-proof as possible, um, avoiding building more and more fixed equipment into the classrooms. There's very little casework that is being put in classrooms. Ten years ago, I could show you classrooms that um, districts would ask us, if there was a fifth wall, they'd want casework on it. And now it's like eight feet of base and cabinet storage that's secure, and then a couple of mobile units, and that's it. So um, I think the chance to getting that more future-proof is clearer now than it used to be, because the rooms are more flexible. And as Seth was alluding, when you look at the shell of some of these spaces, it's, uh, there's daylight, it's very accessible, and there's a lot of transparency. The finishes, the dollars per square foot that you put into that are a different decision than how you want to use the space or how you want, at what grade. Some districts look at the Bainbridge model and think, wow, that's not, we're not there at K through five. And that might be. Um, Elizabethtown wanted to um, start that model and now they need to develop a process that is equitable through not only all the elementary schools, but what's the experience when you go to middle school? And then what is the experience when you go to high school? It should further develop those things the kids are learning earlier and again, to the extent that the facilities support the program. They're not going to do the other. It's a long answer, but... Uh, I think you, when you said future-proof, I think that's what I was looking for, that, that reference. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I suppose we're just transition into the next part, which is a review of what we talked about last week. Correct? Mm -hmm. Last time I had accident on this, it lost the screen, so I'm just going to keep it advancing. We just want to see the pictures again, I'm sure. Okay, as far as the York Suburban Project. Um, I'm not going to, unless somebody really wants me to go into detail, I'm not going to belabor the points of what we talked about last week. Um, we do have a couple updates to it as well. Uh, really reviewing the, uh, the project schedule, uh, the projects that are included in phase one and phase two, and the estimated probable cost. Uh, as we discussed last week, the project schedule, we are having a set of projects, which includes the uh, middle school door replacement security improvements and the capital projects and the middle school music suite going forward <coughs> at the end of this month. Um, and that should be completed this coming construction season over the summer. 
And then the phase two <coughs> will be on the Indian Rock East York Elementary Doors and Security Projects and the High School Media Center to hit the streets in October. And that's to take advantage of a better bidding window and get more competitive prices and a better uh, consumer. <coughs> Um, middle school doors, that's uh, 152 doors being touched. It is the uh, security improvements, similar to the way the high school functions with card readers on the floor. Um, there are some alternatives that are going to improve the energy efficiency at um, Middle school music suite. Uh, we brought the plans this week. This is the music suite as it functions right now. There's a keyboard general music room. There's a, uh, a lot of storage that is underutilized here in the middle along with the teaching office, teacher's office. Um, you have the band room with enclosed storage for the instruments, a practice room that's underutilized, and then you have the choral room, which was part of the Swanaker McCall edition uh, back in the late 80s, 90s. Basically, what's happening, uh, this does not allow for proper, the proper amount of storage for the instruments. What's happening is there's a lot of instruments being stored on old library racks out here in the corridor, and they aren't secured from the general circulation happening inside the building, and it's not really where that should be uh, stored from the safety standpoint. Uh, in addition to that, the orchestra is practicing in the lobby outside the auditorium, so the solution is to take that old uh, choral room and turn it into the new orchestra room, have open uh, music instrument storage on the sides of the walls there. That helps with acoustics inside the room as well as get the instruments out of the corridor. The choral needs a larger room for the large groups that they have practicing there. So the choral is going to double up as the choral room, the keyboard instruction, and you can see the keyboard station and as well as the general music education room. We still retain some of the storage here for the, uh, the file storage of the music materials. And then the band room, it's expanded out into where that storage was previously. And again, there is in-room open storage. And because we've expanded the room, we will be adding an egress door since the square footage is over the point where you have to add, you have to have two exits. In addition to that, we are proposing new high windows being installed on the exterior wall here. There is mechanical units. There are mechanical units out here. So that's why we're installing them high, also to maximize the amount of music storage against the walls. But that provides natural light to a space that is an instructional space that currently has no natural light. That's the outside of the building then? Is that what you're saying? The bottom is the outside of the building? Correct. Okay. In addition to that, we will be uh, providing new mechanical units that provide humidity control to all three of those rooms, individually controlled per room. That will be uh, separate from the four pipe system that's inside the school right now. Uh, the capital project that will be moving forward in the first phase, um, there are some of the high school, I'm not going to read through each one of them, there are water heaters at the middle school, uh, in-kind replacement of rooftop units at Valley View, and the in-kind replacement of air handlers at the middle school. So you're doing all the mechanical stuff then, right? Uh, more engineering is handled. About the it. But it will be it's done as part of, of phase yes. one. Yes. Okay. Uh, phase two, the Indian Rock, that's uh, similar hardware to what we were talking about is the card readers and the doors, and some energy improvements. And now to the meat of the presentation. This is the high school media center that we reviewed briefly last week. This is the media center as it is right now. And many of the principles that we talked about earlier today and many of those things looking forward into the future, um, you're asking how do we future-proof a space? And, um, you know, Corey Mason, she was still involved uh, she was in transition at the beginning of this project, and she looked at me and she said, Seth, you have the biggest challenge ahead of you on this project. You have to live with this building. Eight kids still going to be here. So, and she brought up a really good point. You know, every decision in this, um, it has to be something that's going to last. And not just last, it's going to have to be something I have to live with. So the decisions that were made along the way were in, a, uh, in the mindset of saying, how do we make this flexible enough? How do we make this utilizable enough? 
Um, and, and what do we see are the trends that are changing and we know are going to change in the future. So as we talked about in the presentation previously, um, <coughs> these open classrooms, and this was a heated discussion last week, these open classrooms are meant to be used for those groups, are meant to have free flow, and they're also meant to be able to be reserved at certain times for specific instruction. That relates to the media center as a whole. You know, the teacher brings the class there, they do the 10, 15 minute intro, and the students flow out and they're able to come uh, easily in and out of that space and use the materials and resources. At the same time, it's a space where students show up uh, during their study hall and they're able to sit down with a group of two or three other students, or maybe just sit down and plug their device in for charging. Uh, at the same time, they enjoy their time uh, in between classes. We know for a fact that in the future, we're going to keep the volume counts are going to keep decreasing. So having these opportunities for uh, walls that move, fold, uh, get out of the way, and allow for larger group instruction, that's the ideal space. Uh, this space right here is ideal for those kind of situations. As well as rooms that can combine to create larger collaboration zones or teaching spaces. Um, as far as furniture, Emmy, do you want to say anything about the furniture arrangements that we have here? No, I think just again, hearkening back to those different zones, what we're trying to do within this uh, footprint is really kind of introduce all of those collaborative spaces that we have been talking about. So we have those small group rooms, that, which again, can be a small team of students that are working on a project together. Um, it can be just a formal instruction that we have down here, but again, utilizing whichever space, trying to make that as flexible as possible. So again, that's more with the furniture versus having something built in. Even we've talked with a librarian about the shelves in the center. Those will have casters on them. So again, there's not something you're going to be moving every day just because of the weight of them, but you are able to reconfigure that library pretty easily. I mean, all the flooring will be continue underneath them and have that opportunity, but really utilizing the flexible furniture within those spaces to give lots of different groups different opportunities within those rooms. There we go. Um, can we dim the lights here, Dr. Krasner? I think one of, to Seth's point, a lot of the activities um, that we're introducing or developed within there are already happening within the library currently. So. So last week I brought still images of uh, some of the spaces. This week we actually have the ability to move through the space and see it in real time here. Um, as you enter the space, the corridors behind us here, that's the existing doors coming in, flanked by those two restrooms, and you enter into the more public functions. Students can come in uh, and leave at will. The coffee station that was added to the program um, by the administrative team. That's right here off the entry. You can come in, grab your coffee, um, you see the menu up there, and the idea is that this gets tied into an education program. Right off of that, you have the ability for some uh, high top seating overlooking the stack area. And you have easy access to what was called the tech charging area. This is that high top kind of uh, uh, technology zone you're able to have small group and, uh, small group collaborations there. And again, that's adjacent to the, uh, the open learning area, the open classrooms. Did you add a door there to get out of there into the library? Was that, was there, that a question last week? That was a question last week. Um, we had looked at it in plan and we had some still images. This is what is proposed. This is a glass wall that separates the open classroom from the rest of the media center. The idea there is to have free flow of students being able to come in and out of this space. The teacher still has the ability to have a teaching wall and instruction while still having a level of privacy from the rest of the area. But that's different than last week. Last week you didn't have that ability to go into the library, am I correct? Uh, oh, that's opening is now. This is the same as last week. Uh, the discussion last week was do you put doors on either side of this or okay. one door here to be able to completely close it off. Okay. Um, the education program we were given was to try and keep these classrooms as true open classrooms to encourage that free flow of students and encourage the students when it's not being used as a classroom to use these areas for collaboration. As 
far as the stacks go, the stacks have a uh, mobile circulation desk in the middle of them. The librarian actually requested the mobile circulation desk. She said what she has right now, the reason she sits there all the time, is because that's the only spot that she's able to see all the students at once. If you go back behind there, it's a very underutilized desk area, and it takes up a tremendous amount of square footage uh, up on that upper portion here, the, uh, the upper portion right in front of you. She prefers the, the smaller, more mobile, and she prefer to actually have a more usable office, which is what we're proposing here. Now, you'll notice all of the walls flanking this area, we're proposing glass for those. That's to create that visual connection. That librarian sitting at any spot in this area can have views in almost every single space, including uh, the slatted wood walls here, separating the copy area from the general area, uh, including views from her angle from her office directly into that queue and line. In addition to the stacks, um, we're pulling natural light as far into the space as possible and providing flexible seating up against that wall. And as far as the small group collaboration areas, there are some conference rooms. So you can have students working on projects, you can have small groups going in there and uh, having small group instruction. And this is, a, uh, this is a demonstration of that wall that's able to break down and connect two rooms for a larger group instruction. And just different configurations. You've seen similar furniture in some of the images earlier today. Going to the other side, similar kind of configuration. This is the enclosed classroom with the ability to open up into the rest of the media center. And then the large conference room, which is uh, intended to be used for the Trojan Learning Center. And as we talked about last week, the Trojan Learning Center is as large as it is right now because you have the need to have students break out into smaller groups. Once you have it adjacent to the media center existing in that space, you have access to all those different furniture configurations. So when you have a group of a teacher and a student or a group of three students and a teacher, you have the options to break out into smaller groups than other places. And again, this is a mirror of the other side with the open classroom and the, uh, the tech charging area. Is there anything anybody wants to see in more detail walking through the space? Okay. Much nicer with a walkthrough. Say again? Much nicer with a walkthrough than just looking at the pictures. You know, this is one of those things that we've been able to take advantage of over the past couple of years, and it really does make a tremendous difference. Instead of saying, here's what you get and here's one image, um, you can actually see and feel and, and imagine the space in a different way. Questions for Sam? How long do you consider construction time for the media center? That's all in 20 minutes. How long is the construction time for that? Uh, we have this latest for, go back and schedule. I forget what it is exactly. You know, the, we have this latest to start in October. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, we have this construction we starting in May to try and get an early start on this particular project. And we had coordinated with the librarian. She was okay losing the space for the last month and a half of school to open up a better uh, construction area and to try and make sure it's done. So they'll be closing that sometime at the end of April then, because school's over by the end of May. I'm just, just curious, that's all, just curious. I'm going to go back to the schedule here. Yeah. That one was starting construction in May, June, July, August, September, and then close out the punch in October. Does 157 doors with key card access feature definitional future proofing, as we were kind of talking about for those? <laughs> and now some more questions. <laughs> you showed us design trends in new schools, and all I saw was a whole lot, in, in light of this, a whole lot of unsecure 
area. And we're about to embark on three projects, three buildings, making sure that every one of our cells are locked down and we're able to isolate everyone in the building. And not one of those future concepts you showed us would protect anyone in the open collaboration areas. I'm not saying that's good, bad, or indifferent. I'm looking at it from the lens of it should give us pause. Why are we spending a lot of money to lock down every single door in the building? Because it's not where a new building would be. So what do they do from a security standpoint? Security is something also very unique to every district, what level you're trying to protect. Um, I disagree with you on that. Well, I can tell you working with 75 districts, it's, it's they all psychologically have different. Spend. It's a, it's a it's a budget impact, and it's a, a policy and procedure. There's three components, but the process of defining what you want to do is what we talked about tonight. You go through that iteration of security. Uh, Elizabeth Town School District has a full-time person that was integrated with the design, and he will tell you that Bainbridge is the safest building in their school district, and it's the most open. So. I'd encourage you maybe to talk to other districts that have done that. You, you talk about shelter in place, the transparency, um, what law enforcement actually wants and how they want buildings to function is not to put um, you know, ballistic glazing everywhere and reduce daylighting and reduce windows. So there's a whole uh, layering of discussion from law enforcement even down to uh, response times that affects how you implement security. If you have a two to four minute response time versus a 24 minute, you're doing something different. But um, yeah, they, each of these examples, SROs, law enforcement were all involved. And one thing that I would um, encourage to talk more about too is we work closely in, in our um, area. Mike Regan, Senator Regan is um, part of Northern School District's jurisdiction and if anybody knows Senator Regan, his background is in law enforcement. So one of the things that he brought to the table was why is there so much uh, you know, daylighting in classrooms? Why do we have glass in our cafeterias? And when you talk through that process, these are schools we're designing, not correctional facilities. There's a fine balance between lines of sight visibility. The occurrence of bullying is ultimately occurring many, many more times than the tragic events that you see more often. So it's a balance. It's, it's you as a district defining what level of security. Uh, you know, Dr. Ballet at E-Town said, you know, I'm not going to have my kindergartners walk through ball you know, bollards and security alarm systems and being patted down walking into their school. Um, she said, I, I want it to feel like when your family is at Disney, I know that security is in place, those procedures are in place, but it doesn't prohibit you from the experience. She said, these students are here to learn, they need to feel safe, and they need to feel like they're in an environment that they can, they can learn. That's each district's responsibility to kind of define and shape what you feel is the appropriate level. So I can't tell you there is a one-size-fits-all. So I think we, we won't answer it tonight, but philosophically the question we're going to have to wrestle with is, again, are we going to put doors on all these rooms if in five years we're going to open these things up and have these, you know, communal spaces, you know? It. Well, in, in, in that example, which you could also be faced with, um, if that corridor is currently a rated corridor for fire rating, then, yeah, you will need to put doors back in that place. You may choose later to put a larger door if you feel like you want that transparency. There's a different cost to that kind of door, but you may be driven by replacing that door for a different reason, uh, to maintain fire code. So, Or knocking down walls and changing yeah, the structure. I mean, there could be a couple different variables in the equation that will allow you to do one or, or not the other. And just as a reminder to the group, Barry can speak to this. The doors that are being replaced are actually at the end of the useful life. The hardware's falling apart, the, the doors, uh, on some of the projects, East York in particular is probably the saddest condition I've seen before in a school. Um, they, they made them last, Barry's made them last as long as he possibly could. 
but they've reached the end of their life, so that's part of the reason this is being talked about right now, too. And once you're touching the door and you're replacing it, if you're going to add the security, that's the only time you really have the ability to do it correctly. Um, to, to direct, um, I'm sorry, to address some of your concern about how do you take care of security in a school that has openness, um, we just gave a presentation on, on SEPTED. That's crime prevention through environmental design. We just gave that down in the Baltimore area. And there are a lot of principles that go along with these concepts. You know, SEPTED is very heavy on, you know, open it up because, like John said, the occurrence of bullying and, um, and those kind of activities, those happen every day in the school. As opposed to the situations that happen once in a blue moon that get national uh, press. So, the best ways to avoid that kind of situation is to actually create that visual connection through those spaces. You know, these are great for education purposes, but they're also great for observation of students. In order to do that, though, you have to have a certain level of security in the building. You have to think of security differently. So, in a building like this, this is back of Bainbridge. This is that zone that you saw all the openness and the collaboration. If you've got a checkpoint right here that you can't get into the building without the administrative staff letting you in. Once you're released into the building, you've got lockdown parts at multiple locations. <laughs> and even before you get into those education rooms with the openness, you have another set of lockdown points. So it's about creating that layered system that if, if one person gets through in one area, you still have another check and balance somewhere else before you get into that core education place. How do you protect someone from walking into the outdoor classroom and entering through the wing that way? Well, then I From say, how do you, you know, what do you do about PE? You know, do kids not go out for anything? Well, I mean, there, there's a. I'm not really arguing. Yeah, you can't. You Phil can't. Philosophically, my belief is <laughs> all security measures we do are useless. And and I would just go with we are not going to stop the disaster from happening once it starts with any security. But the goal would be to create a system. That responds to look that addresses the local response times, and it's able to slow that person yeah. down enough until those first responders can get there on site. Uh, that pipe dream. Your slowdown is pipe dream. Test security systems, windows, doors, all day long. It's better than doing the opposite, which is nothing. Only slightly. It makes you feel better. Oh, while you spend yeah, a lot of money to do it, that is done. it makes you yeah. feel better. I mean, our best defense, honestly, is making sure that we don't have disgruntled kids in the building. And and we I know that. Yeah, there. that's yeah, mental health. Yeah. But we're going to spend a lot of money to put locks on all the doors. If we don't spend it and something happens, we're all in trouble. We 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 did a terrible job. But if something does happen, it's not going to help anyone. Okay. Can I ask one more, more technical question? Give my background uh, on this estimate sheet that you gave at the end here. It says mechanical unit design is forthcoming. There may be some different, you know. Yeah, and I haven't gotten to that part yet, so let's jump forward to that here. Um, Last week I was asked, you know, come with some explanation as to uh, the estimate here. So we broke this out, gave a little bit more detail, and I was asked, how do you get the, the swing that you have on those doors from the high, high number to the low number? Um, the swing in the doors is 20%. Now at 20%, that's the same kind of swing that you're going to see on bid day when bid results show up. You're going to have somebody at a uh, million dollars, you're going to have somebody at $800,000. The explanation as to how those two groups got to those two different numbers, it all comes down to the way they estimate. So it's not terribly surprising to see this here. But to give you a little more detail, you know, our, our demolition, patching, and painting, we're carrying somewhere between 255 to 300 a door. Um, now, I received an actual door number for the actual cost of the doors uninstalled, and we had to apply what it would, you know, our assumption from the high bidder to the low bidder what that install cost would be, and that's what you're seeing carried second there. The electrical, again, was given to us by more engineering for the swing on the electrical. Now, you multiply that over 152 doors, and that's how you get the swing from the, uh, the 860 
up to be uh, one million seventy thousand. Now, part of the reason for that swing as well, we are dealing with a more volatile bid environment than we've seen in past years. You know, we are having low bidder turnout. You know, many of you guys have heard this from other school districts. There's low bidder turnout uh, happening in a lot of these bid openings. Um, there's an oversaturated market for projects right now, and that creates other problems with high demand for supplies. You know, procuring the materials is becoming more challenging. And on top of that, there's uncertainty on the prices. You know, a lot of the stuff that happens internationally really does affect the construction market, and we've been seeing that over the past year and a half as bids come in. So part of that is also trying to cover the fact that all those affect the project in a way that we can't control. Um, the middle school music suite, uh, Ellen, I believe that's what you're referring yeah, to. That's correct. Say again? That's correct. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was referring to. So part of that swing, we are still working through the process of uh, finalizing the design of mechanical units. Mm -hmm. And we haven't gotten a review with the administrative team here exactly what unit. We have uh, two different options, exactly which unit we're going with. Mm -hmm. So. In that process, we're going to decide what the best fit is for the space. We're going to provide our recommendations, and that's part of the swing there as well. Um, as far as the capital projects, this was more engineering providing the numbers for the capital projects. And you can see even uh, more engineering's numbers are the same kind of swing as the 20% number. Um, the high school media center. There's a question about the furniture on that one uh, last week. The furniture is actually the lowest percentage of swing that we, uh, we provided. The furniture is actually uh, a number held by the district. We were asked to give budget numbers as to what to expect moving forward into this project, and Emmy was able to work with her team to pull together a range. Now, that all comes down to the type of finishes you put on the furniture, the fabric, um, the durability of the furniture, and how much technology is incorporated into the furniture. So. That's the reason for that one, even though it is the, the tightest range that we provided in this. And I do just want to, to bring up one thing. Last week, the numbers changed. Uh, we discovered an error in the spreadsheet with tallies. Uh, the number that was presented last week was this number right here. The actual numbers, once that uh, error in the spreadsheet tally was corrected, uh, those are the two numbers for the high range and the low range. Okay. Thank you very much, Seth. All right, Dr. Adams. Waiting patiently. I was wondering when the next slide was going to come up to have a new high school poster. <laughs> <laughs> so that is something to be able to walk through and see. That does make decisions, I'm sure, a whole lot easier. I know even looking at houses and things like that, that would be nice to know what you're getting before you had to pay for it. But, well, thanks for having me here this evening. Mine is a little bit shorter tonight than some of the usual ones. Just to kind of give you an idea of where we're at in the high school, um, we're talking next year already. So Dr. Ellis was at the middle school today talking with the 8th graders, hopefully getting them excited about coming to the ninth grade next year and what that process looks like. Uh, counselors will be in freshman American culture classes tomorrow to start that whole process, and then sophomores and then juniors, and of course or seniors, hopefully don't need next year's schedule, uh, scheduling uh, time with the counselors because they'll be moving on. So scheduling's already started. So. Those requests will come in, and then the parent cards go out for those of you who are parents sitting around the room. You get the, you'll get the postcards about when those scheduling meetings will occur, and you can come in and sit with the counselor. Um, college, I just want to give an update, too, about we entered into a partnership with University of Pitt for college and high school for our world language classes. So just a quick update. It's going well. There was a learning curve, obviously, involved with our well, world language teachers. This year we're offering... Two sections of Spanish 4 for college credit and two uh, sections of Spanish 5 for credit. French and German are combined 4 or 5 classes this year. So 
uh, they'll move on to the five next year, level five for the cooperation with the University of Pitt. So ultimately our world language students that choose to go on to level five, well levels four and five, could potentially, for a small fee, and I'm not exactly sure of the fee, but for a small fee, they can earn six credits through the University of Pittsburgh, which is, you know, as parents, what we all want uh, to be able to provide for the students uh, to gain that college level experience, but also walk out with six very economical college credits that hopefully transcend uh, transfer into wherever they choose to go to school. Uh, and then we have our World Language National Honor Society inductions on March 10th for all three, so that's coming right up. Uh, just a couple quick updates too. We, uh, Mr. Marshall in our athletic program has uh, now gotten some of the coaches to be on board and it's going to spread hopefully even more so to all the coaches that have been doing student athlete recognition nights, uh, not student athlete, student athlete slash teacher recognition nights. So some of our seniors they invite one of their former teachers to come to one of the contests and they, they write a little something about them and then they present them with a little gift. So the other night was the boys basketball and it was really neat to see the teachers uh, out on the floor for the boys basketball players and the cheerleaders out there and, and teachers are, for the most part, this is new this year so lots of students are choosing high school teachers, but Mrs. Uh, Rothenwald was one of the ones that was chosen, and I can certainly understand why, because one of my twins had her in, in second grade, so uh, that's a really neat thing, and that's a, just a positive connection between the academic realm and the extracurricular world, so that's really good. Uh, Science Olympiads coming up, uh, Minithon is our big one that's coming up, um, that'll be February 21st and 22nd, um, 7 and 9 is the, is the community part of that. My administrative shift is 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. <laughs> if anyone wants to come and help me walk the halls. But I will say, like, I love this district, and that is the <coughs> neatest thing that we do. And so one of them, and when I'm sitting and t interviewing teachers, and of course they always throw questions back at us, say, well, what are you proud about the district? Or what's so special about the district? This is one thing, other than homecoming, because homecoming to New York Suburban is a K to 12. It's not about a Friday night football game, which I'm really proud about too. This is one of those things that I think in the high school, it's a single event where everybody's the same. Everyone wears the same t-shirt. Every, every, there are so many different things. So if you haven't experienced Minithon here, it is really special. And it is a, it is a really neat night where all the kids come together and a ton of chaperones and people are there to help, as well as food. So there's, there's a lot going on that night. So if, if you have an opportunity, that is something really special. And the goal this year is $100,000 raised, which it would not surprise me at all if that goal is met. And if it is, uh, Mr. Whiteley has agreed to, uh, to get a tattoo. and that the, I'm sure the kids will, and he will definitely do that. I know he will. <laughs> That's how he is. Uh, so Minithon. And then uh, March 6th and 7th in the afternoon and 7th at night, that'll be our musical Bye Bye Birdie, uh, which we've doubled our, uh, the people that are involved this year uh, between the orchestra, or the, between the pit and on stage and behind the scenes. So we have over 75 students that are going to be taking part in that musical, which is a pretty special opportunity for them to uh, either perform in front of people uh, or be involved in it, but behind the scenes. So it's, there's a lot of really neat things going on at the high school right now. Any questions? Let me just add that the tickets are on sale online for by Bye Birdie. If you go online, there's a link someplace that... <coughs> yeah, you can pick your seats too. Yeah, you pick your seats and get your reserve seats. <laughs> and the performances, um, and I know I, I see some of you that, that are there when they're there, you can see that our, our students are very talented more than just either academically or athletically or music. I mean, we, we're, we're in a very good place with our, with our students right now. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adams. That uh, concludes our very brief superintendent's report. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we made it through. <laughs> I just add on the subject of the high school that if you'll refer to the front page of the state of the district at the top left, seven of those nine music kids are in the district band concert 
this weekend, Saturday, 2 o'clock at Central High School. Julie, you're up. I'll try to be quicker than the superintendent's report. <laughs> Uh, two items came out of the Finance uh, Committee. Uh, the first one is the recommendation for Crabtree to uh, advertise and solicit bids for the removal of the high school nanatorium ceiling. The second item is um, approval of the 2021 health insurance premium rates, as you see them reflected. For what period of time is that, $548 for single person? That's per month. That's per month, okay. And do we have any idea from Crabtree Road Law? Did they have any idea the other public was going to cost the end of in any way, shape, or form? I, we've not gotten any kind of guess. Best guess from the based on experience or anything. When the bids come in, we look at the bids and see if it makes sense or Aren't not. Aren't they throwing around 80 k I hadn't heard anything, so I was just asking whether, what, what it'll cost to get suffered That was from last time. Yeah. It was like 75. Um, I'd be it's curious if we had heard anything at all from them about doing that. How did these rates be changed from the 7.03%. Is that your question? Yeah. Item number two is the two-year amendment to the child care agreement that we currently have with Hildebrandt Learning Center, which is our Bright Horizon program. Um, the contract will extend from July tw 1st, 2020 through June 30th of 2022 to two-year contract. The profit sharing for this agreement has increased from 40% to 45% for the district of which that money is reinvested into the program for scholarships. Any questions on item number two? Item number three is the board approval for the proposed York Adams Academy uh, general operating budget. It is a 3% uh, increase in salaries. Uh, the district currently has 12 seats, so our projected cost is 51600 It is an extra additional uh, $100 per seat for 2021. Are we, are we going to buy the extra three seats next year? We bought, we had 12 seats, and then we bought three more this year. Are we going to continue to buy this? Only if we need them. I, I know that is that I can't you, 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 under, you, you, you understand because they they figured it the three seats from suburban into the budget. So if you can kind of figure that I'm trying to be honest and transparent that the budget is based on that. And that that's all. If anybody has any other questions that'd be good to help you or give me a call. Item number four is the proposed Lincoln Intermediate IU budget. The budget does reflect a $6,809 <coughs> decrease from the district's share going from $22,500 to $15,722. Any questions on the IU budget? Item number five is the recommendation to authorize Crabtree to advertise and solicit bid for the projects that were presented at the Finance Committee, uh, Property and Finance Committee, as well as tonight. And the projects are listed. I have just one comment. I, I'm really not ready and prepared to vote for the phase two that we're not going to do, we're going to bid, we had said we would bid in the fall uh, to be done in the summer, spring and summer of, of 2021. I'd like to let us sit on that for a little bit and think about it. We can bid it, there's no rush, we can have Crabtree do it over the summer. 
and I would rather see us split that bidding process up. Fine. Just said that we can see how things are moving along, see what our costs come in for the first for the first project for the first phase, and then uh, then do the second phase. So I think phase is definitely not going to be done until a year a year later. I see no reason to go out that that early. Uh, we may change our minds, things may happen, one does not know. So I think we would be wise to do phase one and then phase two. Well, we're only voting on bidding though, we're not voting on go ahead. No. That is correct. This is only bids. I'm just saying, that's my, my feeling. The last item I have for you is informational, a donation from Colonial Manor Nursing for $38.20 for the Valley View Elementary Field Trips. We're a little quicker than the superintendent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's back. Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that this guy. Sorry, my <clears throat> notification. Um, you have the flex terms of Ellen's question. You have the flexibility for the for the things that we were talking about doing later so that we could be ahead of the game in terms of the uh, construction requirements to include in the RFP language that the bid is valid <coughs> for 90 days, 120 yes. days, we'll always do that. so you have some flexibility. That, that. that language is always in the All right. okay. specification. Thank you. <coughs> You've heard from me enough tonight. I, I have Mrs. Geyer's report here, but maybe perhaps we'll let her report sit until two weeks. How did she they, deliver how did they do at the uh, county's the swim team? Uh, well, um, that's all you have to tell me. Is just yeah, not um, <coughs> Sophia did really well. I don't remember the in, the particulars about her performance. Because I couldn't find the times online. Second and backstroke. Back is it second? Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing in, in, they report at a lot of other schools, but not suburban now. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, you, I even went to PA Swimming yeah. to see if it was there. On the first day, Saturday morning, but I had to work on that. <laughs> you should have to work that hard. <laughs> yeah. okay. Right next to the sports course, high school. But we'll have Ms. Geyer deliver a right. full report. And the committee meeting schedule is posted. Mr. Robinson. Be sure as I can. Consent agenda, you have before you the personnel report, which includes retirement and extracurricular. Wait, what? Okay. Will any board member like any of these items considered separately, or are there any questions on any of the items? If not, the chair removes approval of those mentioned items. Any questions? And I'm sure you all join me in extending our congratulations and best wishes to Natalie Hassenfuss after a distinguished career in education. We have a second. Second. This can be a short roll call vote. This will be considered a unanimous roll call vote unless I hear votes to the contrary. Hearing none, motion passes. Mr. Sears. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to just apologize to the uh, board for the length of that meeting, and we will do a much better job, I think, of planning the agenda and setting the expectation for the length of these meetings. We just happened to have a ton of stuff to cover. It was uh, an imposition on members of the board as well as our presenters, some of whom sat for about an hour before they had a chance to say their piece. So that should uh, help them as well. The committee did meet on February 5th, 2020, convened at 520. Here in the boardroom, um, all committee members were present, jo Joel, Ellen, James, and Mike. Four other board members were present, John Lois Ann, Rich, and Steve Sullivan. We approved the minutes of the 1-5-2020 meeting of facilities, and we also approved the, I'm sorry, that was the 10-2-2019 of facilities and the 1-1-15 meeting of the new property and finance committee. Uh, the administrator report covered first property, Seth Wint, uh, Wentz of Crabtree Rohrbaugh reviewed his projects. The committee discussed the high school ceiling situation recommended draining the pool, removing the ceiling, and shoring up the utilities to make the pool safe to reopen. We considered that tonight. Flooring projects at East York and Indian Rock were also discussed, and we learned about some asbestos remediation that would be required at Indian Rock. 
On the finance side, Toby Putt provided the mid-year review for performance of the medical insurance plan. Our annualized costs are running about $425,000 higher than the budgeted projection, which led to the recommended increase in the premium this year of 11.03%. Kathy provided an update on the budget. She introduced several new reports, including some of the forecasts and some of the historical information for added information and transparency for the board and the public. There was no public comment. The meeting next meeting will be March 11th. 5 p.m. here in the boardroom. We adjourned at 8.20 p.m. Thank you. Do we have a legislative update? Uh, the governor is unveiling his budget. It's pretty cool. That concludes my report. Thank you. Well, LIU. LIU. There is no Dawn by Dawn Zarley Light. Uh, when you notify me, she has not received that yet from the LIU. When she does, we'll see that it's on the future agendas. As far as the uh, JOA is concerned, and um, for York Adams Academy, you have before you the board brief report from our January 28th meeting, and um, we already reviewed the budget, and I will look forward to hearing from Dr. Williams about the total number of seats that we're going to... Uh, it may stay where it is. It really okay. depends what the high school needs. Okay. We, we don't exist to serve YAA. YAA exists to serve us. That is correct, but at this point, we need you know send our budget down because it needs to be approved. That concludes my report. For Adams Tax Bureau. The, report, the last meeting was at the last board meeting, so there was a conflict. Uh, I don't think we have a school of technology, do you? No. Uh, you have the board meeting schedule posted, and this is your last opportunity for public comment. No comment, Mr. President. Okay, thank you very much. Bless you. I think we're adjourned.